Welcome to SnoozeCast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. On SnoozeCast, we read excerpts from public domain works and occasionally original stories. We'd like to thank our listeners. If you enjoy our show, please review us on Apple Podcasts and also share it with a friend. The best place to listen to us is on our website, snoozecast.com. That way you can play a single episode and fall asleep without another one automatically playing. This episode is supported by a compliment from a stranger. Tonight, I'll read Chapter 32 from Herman Melville's Moby Dick, titled Cetology. This chapter is a detour from the progress of the plot and Melville delves into the study of marine mammals like dolphins and whales. Moby Dick was a commercial flop at the time, out of print by Melville's death, and only found its reputation as a great American novel in the 20th century. Author D. H. Lawrence called it one of the strangest and most wonderful books in the world, and the greatest book of the sea ever written. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Take a few deep breaths. Moby Dick, Chapter 32, Cytology Already we are boldly launched upon the deep, but soon we shall be lost in its unshored, harborless immensities. Ere that come to pass, ere the Pequod's weedy hull rolls side by side with the barnacled hulls of the Leviathan, at the outset it is but well to attend to a matter almost indispensable to a thorough appreciative understanding of the more special Leviathanic revelations and illusions of all sorts which are to follow. It is some systematized exhibition of the whale in his broad genera that I would now fain put before you, yet it is no easy task. The classification of the constituents of a chaos, nothing less is here essayed. Listen to what the best and latest authorities have laid down. No branch of zoology is so much involved as that which is entitled cetology, says Captain Scoresby, A.D. 1820. It is not my intention, were it in my power, to enter into the inquiry as to the true method of dividing the cetacea into groups and families. Utter confusion exists among the historians of this animal, like the sperm whale, says Surgeon Beale, A.D. 1839. Unfitness to pursue our research in the unfathomable waters, impenetrable veil covering our knowledge of the cetacea, a field strewn with thorns. All these incomplete indications but serve to torture us naturalists. Thus speak of the whale, the great Cuvier, the great John Hunter, and the lesson, those lights of zoology and anatomy. Nevertheless, though of real knowledge there be little, Yet of books there are a plenty, 
And so in some small degree with cytology or the great science of Wales. Many are the men, small and great, old and new, landsmen and seamen, who have at large, or at little, ridden of the whale. Run over a few. The authors of the Bible, Aristotle, Pliny, Aldrovandi, Sir Thomas Brown, Gesner, Ray, Linnaeus, Rundelicius, Willoughby, Green, Arteti, Sibold, Brisson, Martin, La Cepide, Bonneterre, Desmarest, Baron Cuvier, Frederick Cuvier, John Hunter, Owen, Scoresby, Beale, Bennett, J. Ross Brown, the author of Miriam Coffin, Olmsted, and the Reverend T. Cheever. But to what ultimate generalizing purpose all these have written, the above-cited extracts will show of the names in this list of whale authors. Only those following Owen ever saw living whales, and but one of them was a real professional harpooner and whaleman. I mean Captain Scoresby. On the separate subject of the Greenland or right whale, he is the best existing authority. But Scoresby knew nothing and says nothing of the great sperm whale, compared with which the Greenland whale is almost unworthy mentioning. And here be it said that the Greenland whale is an usurper upon the throne of the seas. He is not even by any means the largest of the whales. Yet, owing to the long priority of his claims and the profound ignorance which, till some seventy years back, invested the then fabulous or utterly unknown sperm whale, in which ignorance to this present day still reigns in all but some few scientific retreats and whale ports. This usurpation has been every way complete. Reference to nearly all the Leviathanic allusions in the great poets of past days will satisfy to them the monarch of the seas. But the time has at last come for a new proclamation. This is Charing Cross, hear ye, good people all. The Greenland whale is deposed. The great sperm whale now reigneth. There are only two books in being which at all pretend to put the living sperm whale before you. And at the same time, in the remotest degree, succeed in the attempt. Those books are Beale's and Bennett's, both in their time surgeons to English South Sea whale ships, and both exact and reliable men. The original matter touching the sperm whale to be found in their volumes is necessarily small, but so far as it goes, it is of excellent quality, though mostly confined to scientific description. As yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lives not complete in any literature Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unridden life. Now, the various species of whales need some sort of popular comprehensive classification, if only an easy outline one for the present, hereafter to be filled in all its departments by subsequent laborers, as no better man advances to take this matter in hand, I hereupon offer my own poor endeavors. 
I promise nothing complete. Because any human thing supposed to be complete must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. I shall not pretend to a minute anatomical description of the various species, or, in this place at least, to much of any description. My object here is simply to project the draft of a systemization of cytology. I am the architect, not the builder. But it is a ponderous task. No ordinary letter sorter in the post office is equal to it. To grope down into the bottom of the sea after them, to have one hands among the unspeakable foundations, ribs, and very pelvis of the world. This is a fearful thing. What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this leviathan? The awful tauntings in Job might well appall me. Will he, the leviathan, make a covenant with thee? Behold, the hope of him is vain. But I have swam through libraries and sailed through oceans. I have had to do with whales with these visible hands. I am in earnest, and I will try. There are some preliminaries to settle. First, the uncertain unsettled condition of this science of cytology is in the very vestibule attested by the fact that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether a fish is a whale in his system of nature ag 1776 linnaeus declares i hereby separate the whales from the fish but of my own knowledge, I know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, alewives and herring, against Linnaeus's expressed edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same seas with the Leviathan. The grounds upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows. On account of their warm bilocular heart, their lungs, their movable eyelids, their hollow ears, penum entrantum feminam mammis loctantum, and finally, ex lege naturae jure meritoque, I submitted all this to my friends Simeon Macy and Charlie Coffin of Nantucket, both messmates of mine in a certain voyage, and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted they were humbug. But it known that, waiving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish, and call upon holy Jonah to back me. This fundamental thing settled, the next point is, in what internal respect does the whale differ from other fish? Above, Linnaeus has given you those items. But in brief, they are these, lungs and warm blood, whereas... All other fishes are lungless and cold-blooded. Next, how shall we define the whale by his obvious externals so as conspicuously to label him from all others to come? To be short, then, a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. There you have him. However contracted, that definition is the result of expanded meditation. A walrus spouts much like a whale, but the walrus is not a fish because he is amphibious. 
but the last term of the definition is still more cogent, as coupled with the first. Almost any one must have noticed that all the fish familiar to landsmen have not a flat, but a vertical or up and down tail, whereas among spouting fish, the tail, though it may be similarly shaped, invariably assumes a horizontal position. By the above definition of what a whale is, I do by no means exclude from the Leviathanic Brotherhood any sea creature hitherto identified with the whale by the best informed Nantucketers, nor, on the other hand, link with it any fish hitherto authoritatively regarded as alien. Hence, all the smaller, spouting, and horizontal tailed fish must be included in this ground plan of cetology. Now, then, come the grand divisions of the entire whale host. I am aware that down to the present time, the fish styled lamatins and dugongs, pigfish and sowfish of the coffins of Nantucket, are included by many naturalists among the whales. But as these pigfish are a noisy, contemptible set, mostly lurking in the mouths of rivers and feeding on wet hay, and especially as they do not spout, I deny their credentials as whales, and have presented them with their passports to quit the kingdom of cetology. First, according to magnitude, I divide the whales into three primary books, subdivisible into chapters, and these shall comprehend them all, both small and large. 1. The folio whale. 2. The octavo whale. 3. The duodecimo whale. As the type of the folio, I present the sperm whale of the octavo, the grompus of the duodecimo, the porpoise. Folios. Among these, I here include the following chapters. 1. The sperm whale. 2. The right whale. 3. The finback whale. 4. The humpbacked whale. 5. The razorback whale. 6. The sulfur bottom whale. Book 1. Folio. Chapter 1. Sperm whale. This whale, among the English of old, vaguely known as the trumpa whale, and the faceter whale, and the anvil-headed whale, is the present cachalot of the French, and the potsfish of the Germans, and the macrocephalus of the long words. He is, without doubt, the largest inhabitant of the globe, the most formidable of all whales to encounter, the most majestic in aspect, and lastly, by far the most valuable in commerce, he being the only creature from which that valuable substance, spermaceti, is obtained. All his peculiarities will, in many other places, be enlarged upon. It is chiefly with his name that I now have to do. Philologically considered, it is absurd. Some centuries ago, when the sperm whale was almost wholly unknown 
in his own proper individuality, and when his oil was only accidentally obtained from the stranded fish. In those days, spermaceti, it would seem, was popularly supposed to be derived from a creature identical with the one then known in England as the Greenland or right whale. It was the idea, also, that the same spermaceti was that quickening humor of the Greenland whale which the first syllable of the word literally expresses. In those times, also, spermaceti was exceedingly scarce, not being used for light, but only as an ointment and medicament. It was only to be had from the druggists, as you nowadays buy an ounce of rhubarb. When, as I opine, in the course of time, the true nature of spermaceti became known, its original name was still retained by the dealers, no doubt to enhance its value by a notion so strangely significant of its scarcity. And so the appellation must at last have come to be bestowed upon the whale from which this spermaceti was really derived. Book 1. Folio. Chapter 2. Right Whale. In one respect, this is the most venerable of the leviathans, being the one first regularly hunted by man. It yields the article commonly known as whalebone or baleen, and the oil specially known as whale oil, an inferior article in commerce. Among the fishermen, he is indiscriminately designated by all the following titles. The whale, the Greenland whale, the black whale, the great whale, the true whale, the right whale. There is a deal of obscurity concerning the identity of the species thus multitudinously baptized. What then is the whale, which I include in the second species of my folios? It is the great mystery of the English naturalist, the Greenland whale of the English whalemen, the baleen ordinaire of the French whalemen, the Groland's wallfish of the Swedes. It is the whale which for more than two centuries past has been hunted by the Dutch and English in the Arctic seas. It is the whale which the American fishermen have long pursued in the Indian Ocean, on the Brazil banks, on the Norwest coast, and various other parts of the world, designated by them right whale cruising grounds. Some pretend to see a difference between the Greenland whale of the English and the right whale of the Americans, but they precisely agree in all their grand features, nor has there yet been presented a single determinate fact upon which to ground a radical distinction. It is by endless subdivisions, 
based upon the most inconclusive differences that some departments of natural history become so repellingly intricate. The right whale may be elsewhere treated in some ways with reference.